to the service of Christian worship. The congregation of Wabash Avenue Presbyterian Church in Crawfordsville, Indiana, our church board, the session, our deacons, and uh, this pastor, John Van Nuys. We welcome you to uh, this virtual, virtual worship service. I imagine on the other side of the screen there are many familiar faces, and there probably are some new faces too. Please know that you are welcome and you are most definitely included in that great cloud of witnesses, uh, in that um, company of saints that are one uh, in the spirit. Uh, and uh, you're part of that, and we're glad you're a part of this service. Today we're observing Trinity Sunday. That is the Sunday in which we uh, acknowledge that uh, our God is one God in three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer. So in the, in the uh, mystery of that great truth and great love, let us now come before the Lord in worship. Please join me in our prayer of preparation for worship. Holy and gracious God, pour out your Spirit upon us that we may worship you in spirit and in truth. Amen. Our call to worship comes from liturgy that uh, throughout this service will be based on uh, the triune nature of our God. You may read aloud alternating if you have downloaded the worship order uh, and alternating with others who are present. Let us worship God. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Let us worship God. Our opening hymn is Holy, Holy, Holy. It is sung by our choir director, Jenny Fight Swift. Holy, Holy, confession comes from the book of Jeremiah chapter 31. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel, says the Lord. 
I will put my law within them, and I will write it upon their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. I will forgive their evil deeds, and I will remember their sins no more. In penitence and faith, let us confess our sins to Almighty God. Presence, life, fire, God who is three in one, we confess that we have turned away from you. We gaze upon ourselves as if we are worthy of worship. We take your creation into our hands, not to love, but to use and then discard. We go to the peoples of the world, not to serve, but to press them into our service. We do not deserve that you would even notice us, but we pray for mercy because you are merciful. Flame of love, purify us from sin. Eternal now, lead us to your truth. Risen one, baptize us into union with you. Transform us into faithful disciples who worship you alone, God, who is Trinity. Amen. Let us now continue our prayer of confession by confessing our sins in silence. Amen. Hear the good news. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. May the God of mercy who forgives you all your sins strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep you in eternal life. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Let us pray together our prayer for illumination. Holy God, as your word is proclaimed, show us the error of our ways, that we may walk in the purity of your way. Dispel the darkness of our minds, that we may behold the light of your truth. Correct the waywardness of our lives, that we may be found in your life. Transform the hardness of our hearts, that we may be shaped by your love and saved by your grace. Amen. Our scripture today comes from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 14, verses 1 through 12. So listen now for God's word as it speaks to you. When Herod the ruler heard reports about Jesus, and he said to his servants, This is John the Baptist. He's been raised from the dead. And for this reason, these powers are at work in him. For Herod had arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Because John had been telling him, it is not lawful for you to have her. Though Herod wanted to put him to death, he feared the crowd because they regarded him as a prophet. But when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before the company, and she pleased Herod so much that he promised on oath to grant her whatever she might ask. Prompted by her mother, she said, Give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. The king was grieved. And yet, out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he commanded it to be given. He sent and had John beheaded in prison. The head was brought in on a platter and given to the girl who brought it to her mother. His disciples came and took the body and buried it. Then they went and told Jesus. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It was an ugly scene, an innocent man killed in a grotesque way. It took place in a land where some lives mattered more than others. It took place in a time when brutality was so common that most just felt that it was business as usual, just the way it is. Most felt powerless and figured that there was nothing they could do. And so evil, injustice, and death ruled the day. In Jesus' day, many, many innocent people were killed by an indifferent power structure. Roman rule was brutal. Pontius Pilate, the authority who executed Jesus, responded to an uprising in Samaria in 20 AD by crucifying 20,000 Samaritans. And why did he do that? Well, why not? They dared defy Roman rule. They got out, the, out of line. And the Roman peace, the Pax Romana, was kept by keeping them in line, by keeping their likes in line, people like John the Baptist. They were killed to perpetuate the status quo, while the vast, silent majority did nothing. They had no power to change anything. It was an ugly scene, an innocent man killed in a grotesque way. It took place in a land where some lives matter more than others. It took place in a time when brutality is so common that most feel that it's just the way things are. Most feel powerless and figured there's nothing we can do. And so evil, injustice, and death have their way. George Floyd, Brianna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, Trayvon Martin, Eric Garner. These are just a very few of the names of innocent African Americans who've been slaughtered. Figures on lethal police shootings show that for African Americans, there's a much higher chance of being fatally shot. Although African Americans make up 14% of the population in 2019, they accounted for more than 23% of fatal police shootings. African Americans are arrested for drug abuse at a much higher rate than white Americans, although surveys show that drug use is at similar levels. African Americans are imprisoned five times the rate of white Americans. In 2018, African Americans made up 13% of the U.S. population, but represented 33% of America's prison population. Whites made up 30% of the prison population, despite representing 60% of the U.S. population. These statistics show that we have a problem. But the more damning part and truth is this. I am part of that problem. As a white male, I have never consciously discriminated against an African American. Nonetheless, I am the primary beneficiary of the way the deck has been stacked against people of color. And because I say nothing, because I do nothing, nothing changes. More black lives are lost. More minority youth go to underfunded schools. More African-American newborn babies die. More African-American elderly die from COVID-19. And more innocent men like George Floyd die. This will not stop until we white Americans acknowledge 
that we are the beneficiaries of the resources, opportunities, advantages, and exclusions which privilege us over and against people of color. Unless we recognize that, unless we wrestle with that, unless we work with the excluded to change the systems, black lives will continue to not matter. Our creator made us all in the image of God. Each of us is an image bearer. If God created us equally and loves us equally, then we must make that love equally real in our hearts and in our world. Justice is what love looks like in the public square. Everyone being treated with dignity, respect, and love, with equal protection under the law, and with equal opportunity to flourish. That was Martin Luther King's dream. That is God's dream. And that should be our dream as well. But for that dream to happen, we have to wake up. We need to do the hard inner work of naming just how we benefit from the way things are. We need to speak up. When someone tells a racist joke, we need to confront that person to say that that is how the evil one whispers hate and propagates and perpetuates prejudice. We need to tell our leaders that we expect them to do right by everyone in how budgets are made and how laws are enforced. We need to support our police by commending the good cops who make up the vast majority of law enforcement and by condemning the bad cops who keep a knee on a neck for nine minutes while hearing the words, I can't breathe. We've got work to do. And we have a God who stands ready to lead us into a brighter, better day for us all. The God who made the world is eager to work with us to make the world right. Our Savior, who was unjustly executed, commands us to love everyone every bit as much as he loves us all. Our Savior will save us from hate, our Savior will save us from ourselves. The Holy Spirit will show us new ways to live if we're willing to learn, change, repent, grow, and welcome those who God welcomes. By grace, you and I can be free from the evil of racism. If Christ conquered death, then surely he can conquer what's wrong in my heart and what's wrong in your heart and what's wrong in our world. We can work with God to make sure that this nation, which we all dearly love, is a place where free people live together in equality, dignity, and peace. That possibility is here. If we will open our heart to our God, and if we will open our heart to our neighbor. The time is now. Let us pray. Let us unite our hearts and minds in prayer for our world, saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our troubled nation, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Help us to repent of those things which prevent peace. Help us to renounce those things which keep things good for us and worse for them. Guide all in positions of authority, especially our President Donald, our Governor Eric, and our Mayor Todd, to lead us in ways that racial wounds may heal. 
Hold to account all who propagate hate, who savor prejudice, and who inflict pain. Uphold all who have suffered unjustly, and for all who grieve that injustice. May the violence of the protests stop. May the message of the protests continue until your justice rolls down like waters and your righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. May your love be our guide and goal now and always. For our world in the midst of plague, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Protect all medical care professionals, nursing home aides, and emergency personnel, that everyone who is helping you confront the coronavirus is kept safe. Guide researchers working on a vaccine and speed the day when COVID-19 is no more. Pour out your healing upon all who have the coronavirus that they may live. Grant your healing to all who seek your healing. Among those known to us, O God, we pray for Bill, John, Judy, Linda, Marty, and Roger. Send your healing spirit upon those who are sick in body or mind. Restore them to health and restore them to the joy of your salvation. For our enemies, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Transform them and us, and us so that every heart brims with compassion and forgiveness. For those who mourn, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Be with all who grieve, especially those who mourn for Helen, Scott, and Barry. Grant them your presence and your peace. For all who are forgotten, discarded, and alone, and who have no one to pray for them, Almighty God, hear our prayer. Pour out your grace upon them and upon these silent burdens and concerns we have for these persons and issues which we now name silently before you. In your mercy, almighty God, receive these prayers and according to your wisdom, provide all that is needed for mercy to flow, for your salvation to triumph and for your kingdom to come. We ask this in the name of your son who taught us to pray saying, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is kind of an awkward one for white folks like us to sing, but I figure we need to learn some new dance steps, some new ethical moves, some new ways of being more fully human. So let us together join in the first three verses of We Shall Overcome. We shall overcome, we shall overcome. We shall overcome someday. Oh, deep in my heart, I do believe that we shall overcome someday. We'll walk hand in hand, we'll walk hand in hand, we'll walk hand in hand someday. Oh, deep in my heart, I 
I do believe that we'll walk hand in hand someday. We shall live in peace. We shall live in peace. We shall live in peace someday. Oh, deep in my heart, I do believe that we shall live in peace someday. Receive now the charge and the benediction. I charge all of us to hasten the day sung of in this song when all of God's children are one, where everyone is loved, where no one lives in fear, and everyone knows the justice of God because they know the love of their neighbor. Let us work for that day, yearn for that day, and make that day, that dream, a reality in our hearts and world. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord turn a shining face toward you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forevermore. Amen.